So we are now at the beginning of part two, 23b of our course on mathematical signal processing, mathematical methods for signal processing. So we're discussing mild distribution sigma, which have well distributed individual support with single points. And the claim is that they are just weighted sum of Dirac's with bounded sequence. So you could say L infinity of the index set. There's also converse. If you're putting such, such things together and you're using bounded sequences, and now it depends a little bit on the density. If you're getting more and more dense sets, then you cannot control the norm anymore. So it's a constant, which depends now on, on the density, on the separation amount. Then such measures will be also define actually elements in the dual of Wiener's algebra, which we know is a bit larger, which has a less sensitive norm. But if it's a functional in the Wiener algebra, WRD, it's also a functional on the, in, on the zero. So the zero prime norm controls the element in the dual space of Wiener's algebra. And that will be shown to be or indicated, I don't give details proof, a constant which only depends on how many points you have in the ball of a fixed radius times the soup of the coefficients which appear. So the interesting part will be how do we handle uh, this isolation of the individual points and again we will use a lot our uh, fine partitions of unity or so so the first thing is you're telling me that you're uh, only having a set with eta separation and this usually if i have to subdivide the separation into pieces i i tell myself okay i use some delta which should be just anything which is fixed and smaller than one third of this positive value eta. So it's a positive value. And then I choose a fine, a de delta fine partition of unity. And then what we are looking for is kind of, we have two index sets. That's maybe important to explain uh, instead of just reading the text, you have two index sets. The partition of unity has our traditional index set I, so I, little i is running through the index set of the partition. And we have our points. And they're also labeled with x1, x2, x3. And we can think of sequences in both ways, but that's not relevant. So I write it in the, on purpose in an abstract way. Then you're saying, OK, uh, there is some point where this partition of unity element is applied. So you take the fifth point and find out that uh, psi with number 20 is is okay. So we clearly know that this means we are in the support. It means that this fifth point was in this delta ball around the center of this element from the bupu with number 20. And so they cannot be far away from each other. So and now I'm saying that this same psi i will not be relevant for any of our other points. So if you give me not point number five, but point number seven or 12 or anything which is different from five, it was fine. So we fix the index J that's concentrating on the point that's in the support. And we look at all the possible indices that occur. And there are maybe more than one. So in, in the picture uh, with the flat plateau functions, I tried to make it one, but in, if you take a triangular basis, I mean, if you're at a uh, standard triangular basis, you're at, uh, I don't know, one third, uh, the, the central and then two, two or three and in multidimensional, several of them will be non-zero. But what you can say is all of these elements which are at this fixed element, I was calling it number five, will be not far away. And all their values will be, of course, in a delta neighborhood of, of the new center and of Xi. And since uh, xj is not far from xi, and psi i is living in the delta ball around xi, so we are not further away than a ball of radius 2 delta from the xj. So all the relevant things are far away. So I can say, well, let's give a name to this index set. So these are all the pieces of our partition of unity which are relevant for point number 5. This is a sub 5, and we do this for every. Now the simple claim is this, this uh, separation means 
nobody, none of these psi i's will serve two of those points. That means in an abstract way, you look at all the indices for number five and six and seven. And if you take two different indices, j and j prime from your index set j, then uh, you will see that uh, nothing happens. And that's quite clear because your point x j, how far is it away from the center of your point uh, that's relevant here for the other guy, for, for j? And we have assumed j is different from j prime. And then you're saying, well, this is the inverse triangle inequality. So you could read it backwards and say, well, we know that xj minus xj prime, this difference is at most. Now you're saying, I'm going from xj prime to xi and then from xi to xj. So that would be bring it over, you have this. So clearly you can pull it over and say, well, this distance was at least three delta, or was our eta. And this is distance is at most two deltas. This is this condition here, which means that this is not, this is, it is certainly more than a delta. And that means that if you write, um, yeah, that, that, uh, that means that the xj is beyond the support of the, of the, uh, is outside of the support. I'm sorry, I have to take a short break. So we have seen there is a distance and that distance ensures that uh, the psi doesn't contribute to, uh, to the, at, at the point J prime. So these index sets, uh, every, every point X J, which we have is listed in, in these points. And so when you're saying I take all the pieces, then only those pieces which are relevant to some extent because the support is uh, this union of all these xj's. You can concentrate on these parts, but each of these local parts is here. And now the point is that if you take the local parts, then you have isolated these points and that's the main person purpose of this. So what can I say? Uh, that the sum is the sum of those pieces. These pieces have one point support, so there are coefficients. And there's only one point left for this partial sum, so it's a delta. So this is the lemma applied to, to this situation after isolating everything. And now what I have to show you is that uh, this uh, norm estimate on the coefficient, the norm estimate on sigma allows you to estimate the coefficients. So we have to choose a function f, which has small support and uh, which has the value one. So we can compress a triangular function with the narrow support. And in our case, I would say, let's take it again with the delta support uh, so that if you take the triangular function and you move it to the point number five, you get, of course, that the shifted version of the triangular function at the new position is a difference of two equal values. It's f of zero, it's one. So I have shifted the peak of my triangular function exactly to the point x with the fixed number. But this means, a bracket is missing here, that uh, these uh, other values have to be zero. So if you apply uh, sigma to this, to such a function, one of these functions, you pull out, um, yeah, that's not a very good, I should say maybe you fix J zero, one of these elements, each time you shift this concentrated little function to this new position, you pull out this coefficient, which is living at this particular. So here it's a sum over all of them, all the values except the one with, let's say number five is zero. So it's just uh, getting your coefficient number five. But what does it tell you about the absolute value of this complex number? Well, this is the value of the functional taken in absolute values. How big is the functional on the test function? It's the norm of the, of the sigma as a mild distribution on the space of test function. You see, we're repeating ourselves now, but they all have the same norm because they are just translate of one fixed function. And therefore, I should put this constant into the into the uh, estimate, but uh, yeah, I think we can take that as norm one. That's why we get this 
estimate that we had in the beginning, the blue formula. So we are now at this point. Now there's an opposite, uh, now less important, but also quite useful statement. Uh, that's the statement that if you're taking a measure, it, it really is a measure, it's an unbounded measure, which is a sum of coefficients with deltas. And these deltas are, as we said, eta separated, then you can uh, estimate it and you can get the functional. Uh, now, the idea here is that you s use the atomic representation. So whereas the original definition, okay, we can also take the original definition. We take a decomposition of a decent function in C0 into little pieces. Then, um, let's say with triangular functions or so, then the sum of the maxima of the triangular localized functions is finite. So each of these triangular function is living in some interval in some cube. And uh, therefore, uh, and then uh, we can estimate it with the soup norm or so. So um, if you're asking me now, what is the action of such a sigma? It's now a sum of delta xj on the, on the, on the test function k, which is just anything which is concentrated on a ball, so if the support is, and it's normalized with norm one because all the other ones are adding up by this. Then you're saying, okay, I'm counting how many points I have and I'm leaving out this argument because we have seen this already much earlier. You're getting in a separated set, you can make little balls, they're maybe not sitting like on the lattice, but spread out and they're not touching each other and you cannot place too many, let's say small balls in a, in a, in a pocket. So, or if you have a square uh, and your little ball is, is, or your little circle has area one over 20, it's clear that you cannot place more than 20 such circles inside something which has area one. Uh, maybe we should make a plot of this, but it's just counting how many you hit of these points in this support of the area. And then you are estimating the action of this delta it's, that's giving you K of X. So actually there should be also an absolute value here, absolute value K of XJ, but they are all uniformly bounded by the size of your atom. So this is one, so this disappears here. And the remaining thing is the soup over the J multiplied with the K. Now you can imagine if you pack your lattice, for example, more closely, you get more points in the same unit ball. Yeah, just take how many integer points do you have in the interval from minus five to five? It's roughly 10. How many points do you have if you multiply your lattice or compress your lattice to have lattice constant one third? Well, you have roughly speaking three times as many. So it really depends on the eta, on the amount of separation that allows you to estimate this number K, which is the number of points that you have in a ball of radius one around an arbitrary point. And this is uh, kind of a natural thing. Okay, I think uh, we have done enough theory. I had still something else, but uh, it's, I think it's better to switch now from, um, from theory to again, some experiments which I did with MATLAB. This time I have already prepared it. So I will try to switch directly to the live editor. Um, you see, I think that should work. Please confirm in the chat that I'm showing you the right thing to avoid blind, blind working. Can you see the, can you see the uh, live chat? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, this time I will try to do it and I hope you can see it uh, in such a way that you're seeing the output to the right and uh, not in between. I think that was more convenient to, to do this. I have used mostly my own routines or some of them so at the moment you may not be able to repro or certainly I can, um, you cannot do that yours, yourself, but I'm also willing to share this. So the first thing is 
this question about periodicity and plotting and data structure. So I have repeatedly mentioned that we are talking when we are doing discrete Fourier analysis, we're talking about functions which are not just finite vectors, but which are finite vectors viewed as periodic discrete signals. That means we wrap these signals up and think of the graph of this as a stem command on the cylinder. And that means it's periodically going around and round and round. And so uh, the natural display of a periodic Gauss function would be something like this train of Gauss functions with some distance. The distance is of course kind of the radius of our unit circle. Now, uh, the data structure tells you, well, we are having a function on the unit roots of order n and we label them by omega to the power zero, omega one and so on. So usually for the unit roots of order eight, I'm saying you're starting with zero degree, 45 degree, 90 degree, and so on. You go in the mathematically positive sense, but the Gauss function is a function which is on the real domain. And here you have labeled it with zero. Maybe I should have put the labels lower also in a different way, but you should think of this Gauss function being left and right symmetric. So if you go to the unit circle, yes, the data structure should be in order to be correct for analogy with the continuous case B as the red graph is shown to you. But if you want to display the plot, it should look like this continuous Gauss function and therefore it should give a graph which is the green one. So that's why I'm using this uh, um, plot C command, which is very roughly speaking, the plot with the FFT shift, but unfortunately the FFT shift doesn't change the basis, so it's a little bit more than this, and I think one should not uh, use it uh, in this way. Okay, so um, now the idea of my routine, and I will try to explain that a little bit, uh, of this Gauss function, and still labeled Norbert Keiblinger's Gauss function, is to say we are having a continuous Gauss function, which is Fourier invariant, and we are uh, getting this, we find out that this function is Fourier invariant in the discrete sense. Now, what we know is that um, the unit vector at zero, which is delta zero goes to constant one. So we could also do this, uh, but that's not necessary. We know that the Fourier matrix is constant one in first row, first column. So and that would give a vector of length n from a vector of length one, unit vectors at length one. Uh, the constant vector one gives one squared plus one squared n times, and then you take get n, and then you take the squared. So only if you take the unitary version of the FFT or discrete Fourier transform, which means divide by square root of n will give you the right uh, expectation. And what you can see here, we have n equals 480, you're getting exactly this. Now, uh, what I'm also doing is, and that, uh, that was some, some preparation of, uh, uh, for something that I plan to do next uh, week probably, that's how to go from the continuous to the discrete and vice versa. So roughly speaking, if your n is given, you want to have a signal of length n and you try to make it uh, sampling values of the original function, which you think of it as if it was a periodized function. So if you have such a plot of a periodized Gauss function, we know that it's practically, if you sample it near zero, maybe here, it's just, um, it's just the Gauss function itself because uh, uh, Gauss at minus plus three is already close or below numerical precision of MATLAB or so. So yes, we should formally the periodization with the square root of n. Uh, and then we're doing it and, and uh, this would be a function like this. And then we do a sampling with one over n. So in our case, uh, we, we do this for n equals 480, just also to show you, I mean, you can sample a Gauss function for any lattice. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, this particular lattice. So what I wanted to, uh, demonstrate this here, what happens if you replace n by 4n? It means that you're just saying, now I'm taking uh, the sampling rate is doubled. So instead of 
sampling at some lattice, I take a midpoint between every uh, sampling point of the original version, but I also periodize more coarsely. So, I mean, I can use this routine, and that, that's a, at the moment just a, a test what, what it is doing. And I'm saying, well, every second value of this is a value which is one of the values which you get with n. And uh, then I was comparing these two expressions and I was saying, okay, if I take a discrete Gauss function with lengths four times 480, and I take every second value, I get a curve which is apparently the same as the original curve which I was plotting up to some factor. And of course, if you see this number 0 0.70 and so on, you think, oh, that looks like one over square root of two. That's why I put it for comparison. Yes, this is one over square root of two. Now, uh, this is quite plausible. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the following sense, uh, so I'm explaining these numbers now. Uh, what is the norm of our Gauss function? Well, for our discrete Gabor theory, we need a unit vector because then we can be sure that the norm of the short-term Fourier transform and the, norm, the L2 norm of the short-term Fourier transform, so it's the sum of the pixels squared, is the same as the L2 norm or the energy, let's say, on the signal, which is the sum of the x and values squared or so. So that's very reasonable to do this normalization. And also, of course, when we go to from n to four and we have done the normalization. So these two numbers are just one. Now, on the other hand, if I split my more refined discrete Gaussian into two pieces, I mean, they are clearly orthogonal vectors. So what is the scalar product of the, um, uh, that would be the labels with um, odd uh, numbers. So one, three, five, and this would be zero except uh, two, four, uh, six, and so, so they're even. So if you take a vector, of course, the norm of only taking the no every second value or the one where the even values are put to zero is the same. Here you would say, I take all the values which are at the even coordinates are left and the rest is put to zero. And then you can take this color product of these two and they would be orthogonal. So we have the good old Pythagoras. The sum of these two pieces is something which has norm one. Therefore, the equal norms, and they are really equal, have to be uh, exactly one over square root of two. So that, that's kind of a plausibility why you're having uh, this square root of two factor in between. If you compare it, you have something which due to the different normalization, has to be uh, different by this factor one over square root of n. Now, I also wanted to, to, to tell you that uh, there's a nice way of putting uh, samples of a continuous function, which is a closed mathematical expression into MATLAB, of course. You're so just saying, well, gau is the function name for a function which assigns to the variable x, the value e to the minus pi x squared and so on. And just in order to compare it, I would say, well, what my statement was that we are sampling with one over square root of n, and we are having going up to square root of n periodic version, which I think I should show you once more. So we have this periodic version, but we do it in the red style. So we are starting from zero until one half of the period. And then for the rest, we go from the negative to this here. But the midpoint, of course, should be in, in our case, should be part of the discrete vector, but it should not show up twice. So what I'm doing here is to say, well, first I'm checking. If I take my step, so it's one over square root of n and uh, I just want to look at the first six values. So I'm starting with zero, step with number one, two, three, until five step. And then I take the first six coordinates of my discrete Gauss function. So essentially I'm not showing you the code. Essentially it's of course just showing how the code works. Um, then I would uh, 
want to know if these uh, things are the same. So the difference here is um, up to some norm, which I ignore now, um, is uh, 10 to the minus, is e to the f minus 17. So that's numerically, these values are exactly the same. Now, of course, you should be reminded that if you take the Riemann integral of the Gauss function normalized in this way, you get exactly uh, one. Uh, and this has to do, is related through the step widths uh, to the, to the uh, true integral, but our Gauss function is normalized independent of the interpretation as step width. That's why you get some factor, which I don't want to do here. I have recently done a, a small MATLAB routine saying, well, if you tell me that these are the samples of a function uh, and you would like to compute the norm, then you can do it uh, by saying, well, I have apparently access to a Riemannian sum or so. So the point was, uh, we have to know what the period is that should be chosen. And the period was, uh, where is it? Yeah, it's not shown, of course. The period is square root of n. So I'm running this once more. So it's, yeah, of course, it's close to 22. So it's 21.90. So this is the square root of this. Now, what we have to do is to concatenate the two pieces. And we are sampling a periodic function, but it's sampled from zero to the full period, which is not adapted to the center of the Gauss function. So the worst thing or the things that I've seen in applied books is they would sample from the left boundary of the period to the right boundary. And if they take an even number, so if n is even, they would miss the zero. And that's a very bad formula. So what you really should do is you should uh, think of this red situation and you start from zero, you go to the midpoint here. Okay, so what is it? And that's what I wrote down. I will provide a PDF version of this, of course. So I'm, I was saying we have the basis, which is from zero going in steps of step until one half of the period. And the rest is we start from the left hand side. So we start more or less from here, um, but we are not starting at one half because these two points are identified. This point has been already taken the minus, but with plus step, but then we go stepwise until we go to zero, but zero is already taken, which was the first point. So we go until minus step. So that's the last point, the last value in our red curve here is the one just next to the peak value, which is this one here. Okay, so uh, now we are saying we are having the lengths of this vector here and the lengths of the new vector here, oh, sorry, here, here you see it. The lengths of the first basis vector because it includes the two boundary points are one more than one half of n. So n is 480. So one half is roughly 240, but you have the zero and the right end point here, and you have uh, the rest here. Of course, you could take, that should be the same for our symmetric function. You could go from zero uh, to uh, half the period minus a step, and then from step minus half, minus half the period, uh, up to zero. So then we had maybe more fair, but I think the correct way of doing it is this here. So what I'm doing now is to say, well, now we take these two pieces of a continuous Gauss function sampled at these positions. So the trick is once you give me your n, I compute square root of n and say, this is my period. I compute one over square root of n and say, this is my step width. And then I'm gluing these pieces together in the correct way from a group theoretical point of view and I start with zero. So it's like you have remainders modulo five and you will say the remainder class of the integers modulo five is of course zero, one, two, three, four. And then comes five and five has of course the same as zero. So that's the natural order starting from zero and going to the end. And that's what we do. And the comp norm command again gives us 
well, there is a certain factor due to the different normalizations, but the normed version of this vector is really uh, within numerical precision. Now, I can, of course, just do a, a direct plot, but now I'm doing, trying to make a nice plot. I'm saying I'm plotting the Gauss function. I want to plot the Gauss function over the full period. Now I can include the limit points, but that should be at n plus one points. And then you would have this plot in this new figure. And of course you see everything looks like, like this. Now, oh yeah, here I have, you know, I have included it. Um, I was uh, writing a short, um, a command here, maybe I can type uh, this L1. So it's actually a little L1 norm based on the sampled. I'm not sure if that works, but uh, yeah, okay. You see here, it's a completely harmless uh, routine. It just says, you give me data and the step with, that's a step in the time direction, yeah. And then you're saying, well, a Riemannian sum is of course, multiply all your point values with the step widths. So kind of that's kind of all you, all you do. But the result that you get here is, uh, uh, the result was the number above. So this number, answer number one is giving you, we have really computed the Riemannian sum, which at least up to four digits is one. So we, we really see, what also Gebra was giving us by using the integral command, we're getting integral one. So it's a normalized Gauss function, but it's not normalized in the sense of, of uh, the L2 sense. So of course the L2 sampling norm is just the same thing. Take the data squared, sum up with a step width, and then you take the square root and uh, you get a number which is 0.8409. Now you might not know what it is, um, but uh, either by guessing or by doing it with, uh, with a more formal thing, uh, you can get uh, that it's a square root of the square root of two. Now, I thought it's also nice to kind of jump in between theory and, and continuous realization of the theory. What can you say about a Gauss function, a two norm of a Gauss function? Well, what does it mean to take the L2 norm up to taking one squared or so? You would expect that you should just take the Gauss function, square it, and you get the integral of the squared Gauss function. Now, what is the integral of the squared Gauss function? Uh, and uh, how does the, in the Gauss function change if you square it or so? And I wanted to show you kind of the opposite what happens if you convolve a Gauss function with a Gauss function? And now in the background, I have in my mind, of course, that I'm doing a very good discrete approximation of my uh, uh, continuous Gauss function. Sorry, that's a little bit too much here. But uh, I do the same thing now on the free transform side. So we don't care now that the free transform of a discrete Gauss function is just up to the factor square root of n, another Gauss function, and that it's the same, but I'm just saying Gauss convolved with Gauss is, uh, well, go to the free transform domain, multiply in a pointwise sense, this point star is pointwise multiplication, then you are going back to the time side, but we know that you're getting a real valued function. So if there is a tiny imaginary part, let's throw it away, it's more correct afterwards. And then the question was, how does this compare to taking a square root? So we have uh, knowledge about square roots and so on. And it turns out that uh, this is the second uh, statement here, that it's exactly the same. So I could either take, uh, taking the L2 norm uh, is taking the square and clearly the square root of the square of a Gauss function uh, they're all Gauss functions, is um, just a convolution on the free transform side. And uh, so maybe I should say it differently. Convolving a Gauss function by itself or convolving the square of the, well, yeah, we could do this. We could do the, uh, 
we could uh, no, copy this. I'm not sure if, if that's a good idea now, but uh, I'm doing this pointwise square of the Gauss function. Uh, so I'm doing it twice. So let's recompute it. So we are, I want to show how is th uh, that if you take the square of a Gauss function, it's essentially a dilated version of a Gauss function. So the comp norm, another comp norm command is, if I first take the square, it makes the Gauss function more narrow. So I have a Gauss function squared, uh, uh, and I have convolved it by itself. And I want to see how this compares to this original Gauss function. And you see up to the norm here, uh, which I don't care for the moment, if you would normalize it to be a probability measure, the norm, both of them would be probability measures, they would have norm one. Therefore you are saying, okay, um, it's the same to compress a Gauss function or to square it. That, that is the message that I would like to give you. Okay, so everybody can see if you take a bump function, you square it, you get a more narrow bump function because values which are small near zero, they're getting even smaller. Our whole Gauss function has a graph between zero and one. Therefore, the square of the Gauss function will be smaller. So the integral will be smaller, but how much smaller? And the answer is as much smaller as dilation is showing you, but there is an easy formula that a dilation, and here we are having a dilation by a factor of square root of two. So roughly speaking, on the Fourier transform side, you are convolving two Gauss functions. Maybe you, the original example was you're convolving uh, two Gauss functions on the free transform side, you're multiplying e to the minus pi s squared with e to the minus pi s squared. Well, this is of course e to the minus two pi s squared. But you can also write it, no, no, this is e to the minus bracket squared of two times s squared. So you just split the two into two factors square root of two. So you are doing a dilation operation on the on the free transform of the Gauss function. Well, and that's a compression, area preserving compression on the probability measure on the normal distribution. So that's kind of one of the reasons why the normal distribution and the Gauss function are so important in probability theory. Okay, so uh, this was an explanation and uh, because I have prepared it now and uh, I think I shouldn't start anything much new today anymore. I would like to explain something in preparation of uh, the next unit, which will talk more about this periodization and sampling or so. And I wanted to recall to you something that we have seen already in the context of the Shannon sampling theorem. So my low signal routine just creates a random trigonometric polynomial with complex coefficients in symmetric ways, uh, in first between minus one half and plus one half, uh, and in the range from minus 40 to plus 40. So I'm more or less uh, doing a random vector, a complex random vector with 81 coefficients, and I plot the real and imaginary part, which you see on the left, on the left upper part of the image. I use the Dirac comp, uh, and the Dirac comp should be uh, displayed, uh, sh uh, should be taken such in this case to have the group theoretical interpretation in such a way that the free transform of the Dirac comp is a Dirac comp, and that requires for strict uh, equality that the gap, in my case, three is a divisor of n. So we have seen. Uh, we have uh, a gap of 60, so we are taking, uh, no, sorry, three. So three times uh, 100, no, 100, yeah, three times 480, yeah, you divide by three, it's 160 elements. Okay, so we get 160 samples, and of course displaying them because it's always two zeros in between the samples is something like, like that looks like this. So we are looking at um, the, we are comparing this signal with the sampled signal 
but even the sampled signal is now something which is a mild distribution, which has a free transform, which is uh, here multiplication with a SHA Dirac comp. And here you get the complementary Dirac comp. And so you get three copies and the distance, that's what I wanted to say, is 160. So you see the center is zero. Here the center is 160. Here the center is minus 160. So you see I'm comparing the original signal, which is our low pass signal here, with the sampled version. And the idea of channel sampling was just multiply here with something reproducing the inner part and uh, discarding this other part. Okay, uh, there is something I have to do slowly. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to prepare for a statement that allows us to show that uh, the weak star conversions of distributions can be visualized or understood as approximation in the spectrogram. So roughly speaking, I wanted to show you here at least the first example of something that is a non-trivial approximation. So somehow you would say, well, if I sample finer and finer, well, that means I'm getting these periodic copies moving towards infinity. I mean, in my plot, I can just take a few copies and I wanted to take three as already something very fine. And if you take uh, just two, you would see two copies, uh, but that wouldn't give such a nice picture. If you take it even smaller, you would have to show bigger picture or take a different end. But so it's kind of three is supposed to be a small sampling or you, I could have taken a more narrow thing then you could see this also. Okay, sorry. Uh, now the spectrogram of a band limited function as we have seen it already is uh, given uh, by a picture which is kind of the short time free transform. So it's locally smooth of course, therefore each part doesn't have more frequencies. And uh, the bandwidth is about here. So we could label it here, but we are doing some correlation. So there's a little bit leakage about this band. Now, uh, when, let me see, there, there's some, yeah, okay, I wanted to show first that, that uh, what I was missing. Uh, this is the Dirac comb, so this SHA distribution. I had to zoom in separately to show you that it's just one at positions, I mean, MATLAB first coordinate, second zero are not okay, and four, five, seven, and so on. That's zoomed in, but it's of course a periodic signal with 160 ones. That's why the square root of this is showing here, but you have three spikes. And this sampling on the time side, this multiplication gives convolution with this, and that's giving this periodization. Okay, now what is the spectrogram? That's what I wanted to show you by pictures. The spectrogram of this uh, thing here is, oops. To do it care more carefully. The spectrogram is uh, now going from, by sampling, uh, well, you know, what I have shown you in the first picture is sampling in the time domain is periodization in the frequency domain. Now I'm talking about the picture now you understand why I was taking a low pass signal. First of all, because only when the function is smooth enough, sampling is really meaningful and gives a good approximation with still preservation of, of information or so. But in the spectrogram, you are seeing you are getting periodization in the frequency direction. Okay, now let's do a little uh, experiment of thought. Let's assume that I'm sampling more and more densely. That would mean that you're putting these side strips further and further apart. And after a while, if you are watching it on the window of samples, you wouldn't see it anymore. And so it's preparing you for the statement that is really a quite intuitive and, and quite nice statement that weak star approximation of mild distribution. That's something that I was telling you, it's so important. It comes up in many different ways. It's just another way to say, well, I have something which is from a different world. Maybe I do a weak star approximation 
of my continuous function by a discrete periodic version. So I'm doing something like you give me a decent function in S0, that's in the world of mild and uh, from nice test functions. And then you approximate it uh, with a finite discrete set of samples. And I'm telling you, no, you're actually giving me a discrete periodic signal. And that has a FFT. So you're using the FFT to go to the free transform side. And in reality, what you are getting here is you're starting from such, inf such an information. The relevant part is the one that is appearing if you do fine sampling. So these things are moving to infinity. Then you rotate it by the free transform image. And then you're showing this going back by a piecewise linear interpolation, for example. So this is kind of maybe not so intuitive, but uh, I usually uh, use at this occasion the, uh, the example of pixel images. And I'm saying, well, when you have an image and you think of a, I don't know, a painting or, or some uh, black and white photograph in the analog world or so, then the gray value is a continuous, well, maybe not continuous, but it's a function of continuous variables. So living on a square, let's say you have a square analog picture in front of you. Then you're sampling it and you're, you're taking local and you're getting a pixel image. And now different people are taking different pixel images of the same picture. You would say there are good enough approximations for transmission in one um, maybe high definition television, you need a lot of pixels to get a very good picture. If you're having a low resolution, I don't know, mobile telephone of the old type, you need only very few pixels. Well, if you're not having enough information, so kind of even maybe you have an old recording, but you still want to look it at the high, the high definition television screen, well, then you have to do interpolation. And that's exactly what is mathematically behind all these things. So I think uh, this is meant to be a preparation for, the, for this step. And uh, just at the end, I would like to mention, I have um, done many of these illustrations already using the routine, which I call Bupu spline. So I can build different spline, uh, I mean, yeah, Bupus of different resolution of different shape, more plateau-like function or so. So here you see a plot of plot, plot of the whole uh, collection, uh, whole collection. And my a here is twenty, so that should be visible above here. Yeah, a is twenty, so the distance between this is twenty samples. And uh, so. I wanted to explain at some moment, but um, it's not it's again too late now. I would ex like to explain how I'm doing these discrete pupus because I think that's also quite nice. You're, you can look up mathematical books, you can find formulas for the B splines, especially for the cubic splines. They are cubic polynomials glued together in a particular way. But what do you have when you have samples of a uh, continuous functions? Well, you get something almost equivalent if you're starting right away in the discrete setting, you're doing discrete convolution and you're producing the constant one, which is the sum here, which I indicate here. And yeah, maybe the last step was uh, here I comparing the sum of all these pieces, all these colored local uh, contributions with the constant one. And of course, uh, I'm satisfied because you're getting constant one exactly up to numerical position by using these um, um, so-called bupus. So kind of uh, also during this course, I realized even more than I was aware of before myself, bupus are such a great tool that uh, you can you should be familiar with them. You should be familiar how to use them, how to build them. And this is something that I want to discuss separately in one of the other units. So now overall, I'm stopping the recording and thank you for your attention.